Okay, well, I am extremely happy to be here. Uh, I used to work at WIDER for six years, so this is homecoming for me. And um, I was debating with myself, what should I say in a session on the world economy, given that I've been for the last five years working on least developed countries and special countries. What are special countries? Basically countries that are fragile, that they are geographically challenged, small islands, landlocked. So I tried to put together something that you could find interesting in this global uh, challenging situation of a re a trade slowing down, a global recession, and so on. So what I'm going to do is try to, to take a snapshot at what is going on with trade uh, generally and try to tease out some important trade policy issues and then to have a snapshot at the least developed countries and why that is important. As you know, least developed countries is a very heterogeneous and difficult criteria to handle because you have countries with different level of incomes, uh, different uh, socioeconomic challenges, and then you cannot put them in the low-income countries box, in the middle-income countries. They all want to graduate and become, become in middle income. In 40 years, we have two countries living the categories. We have Cap Verde, a small island that graduated with reasons that had nothing to do with the special and differential treatment given to LDCs. They graduated because of the focus on reshuffling the economy towards tourism and services. And then Botswana, because it was an accident that happened at the right time. They discovered uh, they exploited diamonds at, uh, at the right time. So just moving, moving quickly, what is the discussion in academia, policy circles, the economies everywhere about the what we call now the new normal, what is going with trade? Is trade going to maintain a very uh, slow uh, movement? Uh, what is going to happen? Is it due to short-term cyclical factors? Is it due to a structural factor? Is the dust going to settle and everything is going back to normal? There is all sorts of arguments. So I'm going to argue based on some evidence, uh, what are the two views and where we are. Um, basically, trade, and it's one of the stalag fats for the last 50 years in, in, in international trade and development, trade has been growing at a very fast pace. And even pick up at, at some point in, uh, in spite of the crisis, but uh, basically due to policies, technological innovation, and other is, uh, issues related to transaction costs. But it has to slow down, and we want to know, is this going to remain like that? Is trade growth going to be sufficient to, to maintain a global GDP growth and then to, to, to help to a recovery? So this is what we have been estimating for the forthcoming trade and development report. This is a snapshot of uh, trade volumes. Uh, you have here the developed countries and emerging markets. And the picture, we have this, these are the trends. So we can see that after the crisis here, train remains subdued. So there was a, an impact that, uh, on trade volumes, if you take both volumes of imports and volumes of exports, and not only in developed countries, but also in developing countries. So if you look at the trends, um, trade, remains, uh, trade growth remains subdued and lower than what it was projected if the crisis uh, had not happened. So what are the, the factors that uh, we are looking at to explain this, this performance and what we call, what economists now call the, the new normal? It's either short term, it's cyclical, or it's the structural factors. As in everything in economics, we don't have an agreement. Um, some papers have estimated, there was a very interesting book launched uh, in June in Geneva, that some paper estimated by Vernon Hockman that the cyclical factors is playing around 50% of the global trade slowdown. But then there are others that say, no, it has not, not well, structural factors are important, but what matters here is changes in the structure of trade and changes in the composition changes in demand, and also some issues related to policy, whether there is a rise in protectionism following the crisis or not. But in general, in terms of the rise of protectionism or not, the, the agreement has been that the impact has been at the margin because protectionism has not risen. So basically assuming that, okay, there are cyclical factors, but what really matters is the structural factors that might affect the back to the future or the, 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 the future of, of trade. So 
the first explanation is the changes in the composition of, tra of world trade, especially the growing importance of services. Even low-income countries and least developed countries are, are moving towards more uh, uh, production and exports of, of services trade. Also, the, what was discussed yesterday in the, in the trade session, the new economy, the new trade economy and the new uh, way of producing uh, in terms of the structure of trade and vertical specialization and the growing international fragmentation of production. That has had an, an impact on the on trade, uh, on trade flows. Also, in terms of the composition of trade, uh, sorry, the composition of GDP in the context of the crisis, the changes in the share of investment in aggregate demand have had an impact. And the, as I mentioned, the shifts in trade policy regime driven by a presumed rise in protectionism, although that has been, has been challenged. Later, I will come back uh, briefly to this. So, when we look at the trends, uh, it's quite boring just to look at the numbers and try to relate, okay, it's growing, it's looking at trends. But for me, what I find interesting is what lies beneath the trade policy regime and how that will affect the, the prospects of trade. So it's no secret that the role of uh, emerging economies had had an impact on global trade and global economic performance, especially the reintegration of China in the, in the global economy and then more recently, the rebalancing towards internal demand. They both had uh, two different uh, expected impact I and mean, the, the integration of uh, Southern economies had brought about more competition, more opportunities. South, South trade and foreign direct investment has increased. For example, now in least developed countries, more than 50% of trade is with the South. So this is an important uh, change in the, in the shape of the global economy. Technological change as predicted by theory and empirical uh, research. The ICT revolution. Uh, which in Africa and LDC has had a, a, a major impact, uh, the splintering of production uh, and the value chains. Um, here that already Stiglitz warned us this morning about these dangerous guys, these chiefs to our major regional trade guys agreements. <laughs> Sorry? Guys, <laughs> yes, yes this TPP, TP, TTIP, all the T's, uh, the, it's basically, a move away from the principles of uh, the, what the famous MDG-8 uh, proposed of having a predictable, open, and multilateral trading system. And accompanied to that, we see no progress on DDA, uh, Doha agricultural issues, which also has major bearings um, on low income and, and least developed countries. How is my time? <laughs> um, okay. okay, okay. So. Okay, so going back to the issue of protectionism or not, like what, what we are looking at in the data, and now at ONTAD we are producing very interesting monitoring exercise, is that the increase of non-tariff measures as a way of protectionism. And we know that some of these high sophisticated instruments are used by high income countries. The developing countries don't have the, the, the tools to implement this, but we see an increase in um, uh, utilization of NTMs in relation to, to tariffs or also other sorts of, 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 of subsidy. But this doesn't indicate that protectionism has increased uh, on average. Other issues that uh, we see in this new, uh, new post-crisis uh, uh, period is that the recommend digitization of trade in many developing countries, the impact of climate change and deterioration of environment and biodiversity, and trade, fri trade frictions and frictions in terms of policy making as a result of shocks, especially exchange rate volatility and, and so on. So how do we measure all this? Uh, there have been several econometric models, exercise, uh, projections, but here we have a very simple uh, trade elasticity, elasticity of trade in relation to, to, to changes in income. And it's very clear that the crisis had had an impact on the response of trade to the changes uh, in income, especially across the different country groups. Uh, you see here that the light blue line is the pre-crisis period, and then you see the, the sharp decline in post-crisis. Only Latin America trade is still 
you, you don't see a negative response in the, in the other regions, but it still is lower than before the crisis. So basically, the, this picture is, is, is very telling. I mean, the, the, there is a, an impact on trade and in the in the in the in the post-crisis period. But more importantly than region, we can also see the the changes, the impact in terms of products. And the primary products here, the chalk, has been the, the most, the most uh, significant. So basically, the weak trade performance is reflected in the slow response of trade in relation to GDP across countries and across products. There was, uh, the only positive note here is the in, in services and consumer goods, the, the response has been more positive than before the crisis. But then these, which are of particular important for LDCs and low-income countries, that's where they, they have, uh, been, uh, have suffered the most. <coughs> so, I mean, this is the, the, the global picture. And then I'll move briefly uh, in my five minutes to the least developed countries. I, I thought, sure, I'm not very good saying economics jokes, so I will present the maps of, of LDCs so you can see what our focus is. So the, we have 48 LDCs with South Sudan uh, joining the group, and the majority of them are in, in Africa. There is a lot of sensibility when we think about LDCs and link it to, to, to Africa, but the, the fact that the majority is there, the policy response, then you, you tend to think about sub-Saharan Africa. And then you have the island state, and you have the, the landlocked countries. So how to put these countries in a global development context like the Sustainable Development Goal when you have different constraints and different uh, type of specialization? But still, it's a focus of the UN, and we are responsible uh, uh, for them. So here, if you look at long-term growth in least developed countries, if you see the, the normal trend, and then you see the adjust, this is a simple uh, adjusted trend, you see that the crisis really came at a very bad time after GDP growth pick up in, in least developed countries. So you see clearly there the chalk. Mid-90s, where they saw uh, higher integration into the world economy, structural transformation in terms of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, structural reforms. Uh, then comes the crisis. And if you compare the performance, this is also a very simple graph, just comparing growth of LDC trade in comparison to world real out output. If you see, again, 2008, the collapse there is also very, very, very telling. So what are the issues in terms of global trade and, and policies for LDCs? LDCs basically, in addition to the important socioeconomic constraints, is the issue of trade and geography. The share of LDCs in global trade is only 1%. So there is no much that is well, there is a scope, but this is very, very limited. And the, the problem is it's very highly concentrated to the agreement with the US and the EU and the Everything But Arms initiative. So it's, uh, that's, a, that's a problem. Then you have climate change. Uh, the estimates or the studies show that people in LDCs are five times more likely to, to die from climate change related disease than the rest of the world. Then on top of that, over 70, around 70% 70 of the population depend on agriculture. So any uh, environmental shock will, will affect uh, their livelihoods. And the funds pledged at Copenhagen have not been met, as usual. <laughs> so this is, um, if you think about, OK, these guys are trading a lot with, uh, with uh, developing countries, and China and India have a promise to liberalize 98% of trade with LDCs, but the problem is that 2% left out is cotton and agriculture, which is the major exports of least developed countries. So they're going to, uh, the benefits are very, very limited if you look at in that, in that perspective. Uh, basically, I'm not going into details, but this just show you the concentration in terms, apart from the concentration in terms of destination that I ju just mentioned, the concentration in terms of what they import and what they export. So, the scopes for diversification are there, but it requires a, a lot of policy intervention for that. Uh, what are the prospects? It's expected that they are going to continue growing. FDI will continue to come, especially to extractive industries. If you see here, you have fuel, and um, it's, it's very important uh, for, for some, some LDCs and, and, and minerals. 
uh, they are going to continue growing uh, even above the other developing countries uh, uh, average. There is hope that the extension of AGOA will contribute to the diversification of FDI and trade, especially in, in, uh, well, in African LDCs in the longer term. So this is the prospect. Um, but there are challenges, especially if we think about all the constraints in terms of uh, value added, in terms of the non-tradable, which are very important for broad-based poverty reduction. Um, the linkages between large and small firms in LDCs is another, uh, another issue. And the competitiveness of firms, uh, you take the case of Ethiopia that has pocket of excellence. You think Ethiopia is an LDC and has its own airline, one of the most successful. Uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but this is a, an issue that is gaining importance in, in, the, in the policy discussions with, uh, in terms of LDCs. Um, just going back to the global picture, the slowdown of trade not necessarily means that we re will remain stuck in the new normal. Uh, as I said, cyclical factors are important, but trade openness, there is not a decline in trade openness. So it's not a, uh, it's not a fact that uh, we are, the world will see a trade below the 60% of trade openness that we have been uh, experiencing recently. Uh, there is further potential for vertical integration uh, uh, technology and services across developing countries. And the focus on trade policy is important, but the broader development policy context, I think, is more important for, for, for these countries in the global context. And finally, coming from the UN, you have to think about the SDGs, otherwise it's almost heresy if you don't talk about them. Um, where is trade placed in this, in, this, in this context? Before, in the 2000 framework, there was the orphan goal, the MDB8. Uh, now there is more synergy between the inequality, labor, productivity issues, but how trade could be seen in that as an enabler for other LDCs, I think, is, is an important uh, uh, topic for discussion. And that's it. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so much. much.